Good day everyone, welcome to IT292 Networking 1, module number 8 Lesson title, application layer, protocols Lesson objectives, at the end of this session uh, Students should be able to, number 1, explain the roles uh, The role of protocols in supporting communication Between server and client processes Number 2, determine the features operations operation and use of well-known tcp ip application layer services number three compare and contrast client server with peer-to-peer -peer data transfer over a network number four give the specific purposes of the dns ctp smb and smtp application layer protocols so for the materials of this module we have student learning module and then the reference ccna network fundamentals chapter number three so for the productivity tip successful and unsuccessful people do not vary greatly in their abilities they vary in their desire to reach their potential based from john maxwin so start strong train your brain to ship to work mode by setting a regular time during the day for your lesson set an alarm and stick to your working hours so for the introduction of this lesson we have uh, the application layer is the topmost layer in the osi model and is used for establishing process to process communication and user service in a network it's the interface between user applications and the underlying network whether you open a web page in a browser or read an email you are interacting with the application layer of the network in short it's a layer which invokes or involves human interaction with applications and software to connect users together across the globe although the application layer is the medium through which you are able to communicate with other users so meaning uh, it is the application layer that user, users can communicate to the other uh, users that are connected to the networks so the way is uh, when you search something into the uh, into our uh, web address uh, search bar or search address bar in our browser uh, we are communicating with our application layer so that uh, each user is connected to the internet or network can communicate across the globe okay a set of protocols are required to assist with this communication so there is a what they call protocol na nag assist okay to communicate uh, the users across the globe for example if you have to open a web page you need the http or https protocols okay now so before we proceed uh let us check this uh what they call uh illustration then uh, let's define what is http okay so please watch this one hello everyone in this video we're going to talk about http secure http and ssl now, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Now, this is probably the most widely used protocol in the world today. HTTP is the protocol that is used for viewing web pages on the internet. So, when you type in a web address like google.com, you'll notice that HTTP is automatically added at the beginning of the web address. And this indicates that you are now using HTTP to retrieve this web page. Now, in standard HTTP, all the information is sent in clear text. So all the information that is exchanged between your computer and that web server 
which includes any text that you type on that website, that information is transferred over the public internet. And because it's transferred in clear text, it's vulnerable to anybody who wants it, such as hackers. Now normally this would not be a big deal if you were just browsing regular websites and no sensitive data such as passwords or credit card information are being used. But if you were to type in personal sensitive data like your name, address, phone number, passwords, or credit card information, that sensitive data goes from your computer and then it has to travel across the public internet to get to that web server. And this makes your data vulnerable because a hacker that's somewhere on the internet can listen in as that data is being transferred and steal your information. So as you can see, this hacker is stealing personal information as it's traveling over the internet. So he has a name, phone number, address, credit card numbers, and so on. So this is a problem as far as security. And this is why HTTPS was developed. HTTPS stands for Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And this is HTTP with a security feature. Secure HTTP encrypts the data that is being retrieved by HTTP. It ensures that all the data that's being transferred over the internet between computers and servers is secure by making the data impossible to read. And it does this by using encryption algorithms to scramble the data that's being transferred. So for example, if you were to go to a website that requires you to enter personal information, such as passwords or credit card numbers, you will notice that an S will be added to the HTTP in the web address. And this S indicates that you are now using secure HTTP and have entered a secure website where sensitive data is going to be passed and that data is going to be protected. And in addition to the S being added, a lot of web browsers will also show a padlock symbol in the address bar to indicate that secure HTTP is being used. So by using secure HTTP, all the data, which includes anything that you type, is no longer sent in clear text. It's scrambled in an unreadable form as it travels across the internet. So if a hacker were to try and steal your information, he would get a bunch of meaningless data because the data is encrypted and the hacker would not be able to crack the encryption to unscramble the data. Now secure HTTP protects the data by using one of two protocols. And one of these protocols is SSL. SSL or Secure Sockets Layer is a protocol that's used to ensure security on the internet. It uses public key encryption to secure data. So basically this is how SSL works. So when a computer connects to a website that's using SSL, the computer's web browser will ask the website to identify itself. Then the web server will send the computer a copy of its SSL certificate. An SSL certificate is a small digital certificate that is used to authenticate the identity of a website. Basically, it's used to let your computer know that the website you're visiting is trustworthy. So then the computer's browser will check to make sure that it trusts the certificate, and if it does, it will send a message to the web server. Then after, the web server will respond back with an acknowledgement so an SSL session can proceed. Then after all these steps are complete, encrypted data can now be exchanged between your computer and the web server. And the other protocol that Secure HTTP can use is called TLS. TLS, or Transport Layer Security, is the latest industry standard cryptographic protocol. It is the successor to SSL and it's based on the same specifications. And like SSL, it also authenticates the server, client, and encrypts the data. It's also important to point out that a lot of websites are now using secure HTTP by default on their websites, regardless if sensitive data is going to be exchanged or not. And a lot of this has to do with Google, because Google is now flagging websites as not secure if they are not protected with SSL. And if a website is not SSL protected, 
Google will penalize that website in their search rankings. So that's why now if you go to any major website, you'll notice that secure HTTP is being used rather than standard HTTP. And if you're interested in getting an SSL certificate for your website, I do have a link in the description below for an up to 30% discount on SSL certificates, domain names, or websites. Alright, so that's how the HTTP and the HTTPS works. So we have the uh, what we call SSL and the uh, TLC, TLS being uh, defined in our uh, reference video. So similarly, you would require POP3 or IMAP and uh, SMTP for sending and receiving emails. Let us take a look at the various types of protocols with their uses. Alright, so anyway, uh, before before we proceed, I would like you to uh, watch how important the uh, protocol in our web server. So, what's the effect, okay, when uh, our uh, communication within the network or later? Uh, okay, wait. Oh, that's on the next. Uh, uh, topic that we will be discussing on this module so for now let's proceed so uh, on our activity number one uh, on the left side of the table what I know please answer what are application layer protocols then number two what is peer-to-peer -peer network and number three what is uh, file sharing so after this module you can answer the what I learned so please uh, let's proceed the role of protocols in supporting communication. Now, let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer networks. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, two or more computers connected via network and can share resources such as printers and files without having a dedicated server. Uh, every connected end device known as peer can function as either server or a client. One uh, computer might assume that role had a role of a server for one transaction while simultaneously serving as a client for another. The roles of a client and server are set on a peer request basis. So let's take a look with the uh, illustration. So here we have a uh, peer to peer application, then the client and server in the same communication so we have here instant message uh, meeting tonight I'll be there good night okay so we have here send and read so the role is client and server then we have the network then the other one and device instant message uh, meeting tonight I'll be there good good we have send and read for the role of client and so so every node or end device in the network can act as a either uh, a client or server so now what is a peer-to-peer -peer network ano na sabi lang ginatawag na to niya peer-to-peer network so let's wa watch this one you may have recently seen people talking about peer-to-peer -peer on the internet, but what is peer-to-peer? Peer-to-peer -peer is a way of communicating directly between two parties, with no third parties in between. For example, normally, if Ben wants to send a message to Kylie over the internet, the message leaves his device and is pushed to a server. Then the server sends a message to Kylie's device. Using peer-to-peer -peer communication, the message goes straight from Ben's device to Kylie's device, just like a conversation in real life. Once a connection is established between two devices, each device works as its own server and receiver, allowing messages to travel uninterrupted. The first well-known use of peer-to-peer -peer technology was Napster. Napster allowed you to make files on your computer available for other users to directly download. This is significant because it allowed each person to be a digital library for sharing. Since then, 
Bitcoin was created and gave new life to peer-to-peer -peer systems. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency without a central bank that can be sent from user to user on the peer-to-peer -peer network, just like cash in real life. So, why does this matter? Well, when data gets sent to a central server, it can be monitored, stored for later use, sold to third parties, or stolen by criminals. One of the big benefits of peer-to-peer -peer is how you get to control your data. As a user of the internet, you have a right to your data. But when you use services that require a central server, your data is theirs. While most platforms let you download and view your data, where that data goes and how it's stored is in their control, which means they might also sell it. Peer-to-peer -peer lets you take full control of who sees your data, where your info goes, and how it's used. With no third party holding your data, the power is in your hands. Peer-to-peer -peer also helps ensure security. Since your data is stored on your device, criminals can't exploit a server to get your info. With the help of decentralization and encryption, a user has even more security and independence than ever before. The internet was created with free information and global connection at its core. As a user of the internet, you can choose which platforms you support with your data and time. Centralized systems might use your data and time for their own benefit. A centralized system makes it much harder for startups, creators, and other groups to grow their internet presence without worrying about those centralized platforms changing the rules or taking away their audiences and profits to protect their own power. This hurts innovation and prevents competitors from emerging, and without competitors, the user experience will suffer. Luckily for you, these decentralized... Alright, so that's what they call the uh, peer-to-peer network works. So, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, two or more computers are connected via network and can share resources such as P printers and files without having dedicated server. Every connected and, and device known as peer, okay? Every device or end device, uh, it could be defined as peer. So, can function as either a server or a client. One computer might assume the role observer for one transaction while simultaneously serving as a client for another the roles of client and server are set on a peer request basis so let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer applications a peer-to-peer -peer application or p2p unlike a peer-to-peer -peer network allows a device to act as a both a client and a server within the same communication in this model Every client is a server, and every every client, uh, every server is a client. Both can initiate a communication and are considered equal in the uh, communication process. However, peer-to-peer -peer application require that each end device provide a user interface and can run and run. A background service when you launch a specific peer-to-peer -peer application it invokes the required user interface and background service after that after that the device can communicate directly so here uh, uh, every client is uh, is a server and every server is a client both can initiate communication so meaning there is or it has the same permission in the what we call uh, in the network so each of the end device or what we call uh, yes device connected to the network can initiate a communication so the role is uh, equal okay in the network so features operation and use of TCP IP application layer service, services so services DNS in the network DNS are labeled in the network devices are labeled with numeric IP address so that they can participate in sending and receiving messages over the network however most people have a hard time remembering this numeric address hence the main name were created to convert the numeric address into simple recognizable and on the network 
on the internet this domain name such as the www.cisco.com are much easier for people to remember than 198.132.219.25 which is the actual numeric address of this server also if cisco decides to change the numeric address it is transparent to the user since the domain name will remain uh, as is all right so here in our illustration we can check that the uh, what we call uh, we have a dns server in the client so we have dns server uh, domain system we have cisco.com then uh, translated into 198.133.219.25 so the device use numbers while the DNS server matches the human address with the numeric address. All right. So let's take a look with the example of the DNS. In the world of networking, Computers don't go by names like humans do. They go by numbers. Because that's how computers and other similar devices talk and identify with each other over a network, which is by using numbers such as IP addresses. Humans, on the other hand, are accustomed to using names instead of numbers. Whether it's talking directly to another person or identifying a country, place, or thing, Humans identify with names instead of numbers. So in order to bridge the communication gap between computers and humans and make the communication a lot easier, networking engineers developed DNS. And DNS stands for Domain Name System. And DNS resolves names to numbers. To be more specific, it resolves domain names to IP addresses. So if you type in a web address in your web browser, DNS will resolve the name to a number because the only thing computers know are numbers. So for example, if you wanted to go to a certain website, you would open up your web browser and type in the domain name of that website. So for example, let's use yahoo.com. Now technically, you really don't have to type in yahoo.com to retrieve the Yahoo web page. You can just type in the IP address instead if you already knew what the IP address was. But since we are not accustomed to memorizing and dealing with numbers, especially when there are millions of websites on the internet, we can just type in the domain name instead and let DNS convert it to an IP address for us. So back to our example, when you type in yahoo.com in your web browser, the DNS server will search through its database to find a matching IP address for that domain name. And when it finds it, it will resolve that domain name to the IP address of the Yahoo website. And once that is done, then your computer is able to communicate with the Yahoo web server and retrieve the web page. So DNS basically works like a phone book. When you want to find a number, you don't look up the number first. You look up the name first, then it will give you the number. So to break this down into further detail, let's examine the steps that DNS takes. So when you type in yahoo.com in your web browser, and if your web browser or operating system can't find the IP address in its own cache memory, it will send the query to the next level to what is called the resolver server. The Resolver server is basically your ISP or Internet Service Provider. So when the Resolver receives the query, it will check its own cache memory to find an IP address for yahoo.com. And if it can't find it, it will send the query to the next level, which is the root server. The root servers are the top or the root of a DNS hierarchy. There are 13 sets of these root servers and they are strategically placed around the world and they are operated by 12 different organizations. 
and each set of these root servers has their own unique IP address. So when the root server receives the query for the IP address for yahoo.com, the root server is not going to know what the IP address is. But the root server does know where to send the resolver to help it find the IP address. So the root server will direct the resolver to the TLD or top level domain server for the .com domain. So the resolver will now ask the TLD server for the IP address for yahoo.com. The top level domain server stores the address information for top level domains such as .com, .net, .org, and so on. This particular TLD server manages the .com domain, which yahoo.com is a part of. So when the TLD server receives the query for the IP address for yahoo.com, the TLD server is not going to know what the IP address is for yahoo.com. So the TLD will direct the resolver to the next and final level which are the authoritative name servers. So once again the resolver will now ask the authoritative name server for the IP address for yahoo.com. The authoritative name server or servers are responsible for knowing everything about the domain, which includes the IP address. They are the final authority. So when the authoritative name server receives the query from the resolver, the name server will respond with the IP address for yahoo.com. And finally, the resolver will tell your computer the IP address for yahoo.com, and then your computer can now retrieve the Yahoo web page. It's important to note that once the resolver receives the IP address, it will store it in its cache memory in case it receives another query for yahoo.com so it doesn't have to go through all those steps again. Alright, so that's uh, the, how the DNS works in the uh, network. So, so let's proceed. So HTTP, we have already discussed this one. When a web address or URL is typed into a web browser, the web browser establishes a connection to the web service, service running on the server using the HTTP protocol, URL or Uniform Resource Locator and URI Uniform Resource Identifier are the names most people associate with web, web addresses. The URL uh, just like this one, http www.cisco.com index.html is an example of URL that refers to a specific resource, a web page named index.html on a server identified as cisco.com. Okay. So web browser are the client application, our computers used to connect to the World Wide Web and access resource stored on a web server. As with most server processes, the web server runs as a background service and makes different types of files available. So let's check this one, this illustration. So for the HTTP protocol, we have here a uh, HTTP server then the request page and the client so in the client side so may ari di sang ano nag search ya sa web uh, browser web address bar or search bar okay and then requesting to the http POP and SMTP. Now let's proceed to the POP and SMTP. Email, the most popular network service, has re has revolutionized how people communicate through its simplicity and speed 
get to run on a computer or the other end device. A mail requires several applications and services to example. Application layer protocols are post office protocol or POP and simple mail transfer protocol as with HTTP. These protocols define client server processes with people composes email messages. They typically use an application called a mail user agent or MUA or email client. The MUA allows messages to be sent in place receive messages into the client mailbox both of, the, of which are distinct processes in order to receive email uh, messages from an email service server the email client can use POP or post office protocol sending email from either client or server uses messages format and command string defined by the SMTP or simple mail transfer protocol usually an email client provides the functionality of both protocols within one application so let's check this one this illustration so we have here uh, oh Example of the you know UP and SMTP we have email server MDA so we have MUA here then uh, client sender or client or sender so from client going to the mail transfer agent or MTA so send an email using using SMTP or uh, simple mail transfer protocol then forward email into the mail agent or MDA so we have MDA here then going to the uh, recipient or client deliver uh, email so post office uh, protocol so that's how uh, is MTP or POP works in a uh, in our network so so let's check this one this hello everyone in this video, we're going to talk about SMTP. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Now, I previously did a video on POP and IMAP, which those are the protocols that are used for retrieving email. And now I'm doing a video on SMTP, which is a protocol that is used for sending email. SMTP is basically a set of commands that authenticates and directs the transfer of email. Now, a good way to remember what SMTP does is by looking at the acronym SMTP and associating it with sending mail to people. So as an example, when you write an email using an email client such as Microsoft Outlook, and then when you hit send, the email travels from your computer to your email server using the SMTP protocol. Now this server is also known as the SMTP server and this is what's configured in your email client. So for example if you're using Gmail the SMTP server address would be smtp.gmail.com and then your SMTP server will send the message to the recipient's email server also using SMTP then the email will stay on the recipient's email server until the recipient logs into their email account and downloads the email using POP or IMAP. Or they can just view the email on the server by using webmail. Now SMTP uses the TCP protocol and if you're not familiar with what TCP does, well TCP is a connection oriented protocol and it guarantees the delivery of the email. 
Now this is assuming that the destination email address is correct and still exists. But if for some reason that the email that you sent does not reach its destination, so for example maybe you misspelled the email address or the email address no longer exists, so if this happens you'll get that familiar mail delivery error in your mailbox informing you that the email you sent failed. And just like POP and IMAP, SMTP is also configured in your email client, such as Microsoft Outlook, Mozilla Thunderbird, or your mobile device. So for example, if you're using Gmail, you would use smtp.gmail.com in the outgoing server settings in your email client. And this is also known as the SMTP server setting. This setting tells your email client where it can send the email to. So in conclusion, basically SMTP is similar to a mailman. The mailman picks up the mail from your mailbox at your home and then finds the correct route and then delivers it to the destination mailbox. Alright, so the next one is our POP. Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about a couple of different email protocols and these are POP3 and IMAP. Now these protocols are used for retrieving email from an email server. So for example, if you're using an email client such as Microsoft Outlook, you would configure Outlook with either POP3 or IMAP to retrieve your email on a computer. And you can also use these protocols on your tablet or smartphone to retrieve your email. So you can use either one. The choice is yours. But the question is, which protocol do you want to use? Is one better than the other? So that's what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about POP3 first. Now POP3 stands for Post Office Protocol 3. Now POP3 is the simplest of the two protocols because the only thing that POP3 does is download the email to your device from a mail server. And it only downloads what's in your inbox folder, which is where your email is. And that's pretty much it. It doesn't download any other folders or their contents. So it doesn't download your sent items, your drafts, your deleted emails, and so on, because it only downloads what's in your inbox, and it doesn't do any kind of synchronization. So for example, here we have two computers that are configured to retrieve the same email account. And as you can tell, the folder structures are different on these two computers because POP3 does not synchronize the folders. Now by default, when you're using POP3, the email will be deleted on the mail server once it's downloaded to a device. So no copy of the email is kept on the server. So what happens is, is when a new email comes into the mail server, if this computer up here checks the mail server first before this computer down here, this computer will receive the email, but this other computer will not because the email has already been downloaded. So no copy of the email is kept on the server. However, most email clients will have a setting that you can check to leave a copy on the server so that all of your devices can retrieve the email. Now let's talk about IMAP. And IMAP stands for Internet Message Access Protocol. Now IMAP is also used for retrieving email, but IMAP is a little bit different. IMAP allows you to view your email that's on the server from multiple devices. The email is kept on the server and it caches local copies of the email onto all of your devices. And it synchronizes all of your folders and everything that's in them. So it syncs your inbox, sent items, deleted items, drafts, and any custom folders that you may have created. So when you view your email on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, your email would be exactly the same because everything is synchronized. So for example, in this demonstration, we see that all the email and folders are exactly the same between these two computers. So if we delete an email on this computer here, 
the email will be deleted on the mail server and then be deleted on this computer also. So if we go to the other computer and for example let's go ahead and delete all the emails. And when this happens all the emails on the server and the other computer will be deleted also. And if any new emails come in the email first goes to the mail server then as these computers sync with the mail server the new email will appear on these computers. So in another example Let's go ahead and make a custom folder. So we'll make a custom folder and then give it a name. And because we're using IMAP, the folder and all of its contents will be added and synced to the other computer also. So every computer, tablet, and smartphone that you have will have the exact same email and folder structure as the others. So that's how IMAP works. So as a comparison between POP3 and IMAP, on the left we have POP3, and as you can see the folder structure is different between these two email clients, because POP3 only downloads the contents of your inbox folder. It doesn't do any email or folder syncing, so that's why the emails and the folder structure are different. But in IMAP, everything is the same. The email and folder structure are identical because IMAP syncs everything with all of your devices. Now both POP3 and IMAP are configured in your email client in the incoming server settings. So for example, if you're using Gmail and you wanted to use POP3, you would type pop.gmail.com in your incoming server settings. Or if you wanted to use IMAP, you would type imap.gmail.com. So the question is, which protocol do you actually want to use? And that really depends on your situation. Now POP3 is good if you're only going to retrieve your email from one device. The advantage of using POP3 is that since the email is downloaded to your device, you can view your downloaded email even if you don't have an internet connection. So the only time that you need an internet connection in POP3 is when you're receiving new email or sending email. Another advantage of POP3 is that it saves storage space on the mail server because the emails are deleted when they are downloaded to a device. Now a disadvantage of POP3 is that since the emails are removed from the server and downloaded to your device, you would need a plan to back up your emails in case your device crashes or is lost. And another disadvantage is that your device has a better chance of being infected with viruses since the emails are fully downloaded. Now IMAP is good when you're going to retrieve your email from multiple devices. An advantage of using IMAP is that all the email is stored on the mail server. So whether you're accessing your email using an email client or webmail, you'll be able to see all your email, including your sent items, drafts, deleted items, and any custom folders. And all the email and all folders are all synchronized. So every device that you have will see the exact same thing. Now a disadvantage of IMAP is that you will not be able to view your emails without an internet connection. And this is because IMAP only caches local copies of the email on your device and doesn't download them. However, some email clients will give you an option that you can check to have IMAP download the emails to your device instead of just caching them. All right, so hello how, everyone. In how does our uh, protocols with uh, application layer? Uh, protocol or yes protocols uh, significant in the network gano bala siya ka significant sa ating network now I would like to watch this one okay the history of attacking uh, attacking our data in the network so I know you have already 
an idea about this uh, history in our ano uh, please watch this one yeah, I love you virus Hi guys and welcome back sa video natin ngayon pag-uusapan natin ang pinakamapaminsalang computer virus sa kasaysayan na may pangalang I Love You Virus na gawa ng isang Pinoy. Pero bago tayo magsimula kung interesado ka sa mga gantong video kung saan pwede ka makakuha ng kaalaman tungkol sa iba't ibang mga bagay, i-click lang ang subscribe button at ang bell icon para ma-notify ka sa mga future uploads natin. nag upload ako ng dalawa o higit pang video kada linggo. The message says, I love you, but it's a virus, not a valentine. The love note is the most damaging and widespread computer virus ever. Cupid, who cooked it up and committed the crime, is a hacker in the Philippines. I love you. Ang masabihan nito ang isa na yata sa pinakamatamis na salita na pwede mong marinig sa iyong iniirog. Pero hindi yan ang naramdaman ng milyong-milyong tao na nabiktima ng computer virus na ito. Anong abang virus na ito? Sino ang may gawa? At bakit ito tinaguri ang pinakamapaminsalang computer virus sa buong mundo? Yan ang katanuang sasagutin natin sa video ito. Isang araw, may isang dalawang magkaibigan na may pangalang Rayonel Ramones at Onel de Guzman. Silang dalawa noon ay nag-aaral sa kolehiyo ng AMA Computer College. Tipikal na nag-aaral ang dalawa na may pangarap na makatapos. Sa kolehiyo, may mga tinatawag tayong thesis kung saan magpo-propose ka ng paksa na siyang i-discuss mo sa masasabi ko na parang mga hurado at sa report na ito ibabase ang iyong grado. At doon sa kanyang thesis ay nag-propose siya ng kung tawagin ay Trojan Virus na may ibig sabihing nagpapanggap na isang legitimate software na kung sakali manaatakihin ka nito ay masisira o mananakaw ang iyong mga private data. Kabilang na rito ang mga nakasave na password sa iyong computer. Pero hindi na akit ni Onel ang mga guru sa EMA. Sino nga ba naman ang gustong tumanggap ng thesis tungkol sa computer virus? Ang nasabing proposal ay tinanggihan ng paaralan at sa uling taon ng kanyang pag-aaral, si Onel de Guzman ay nag-drop out sa nasabing eskwelahan. Ngayon dito sa time frame na ito sinasabing nabuo ang structure ng isang virus, ang worm virus na may pangalang I love you virus o mas kilala sa tawag na love bug o love letter. Ang computer virus na ito ay hindi lang umatake sa Pilipinas, ito ay lubos na kumalat sa buong mundo at ang date of outbreak niya ay noong May 5 taong 2000. Ang nasabing virus ay naka-attach sa isang email na may pangalang Love Letter for You. Sino ba naman ang hindi matatakam na basahin nito lalo na may nagsabing mahal kita? Pero kung mapapansin nyo may .vps sa dulo na siyang pwedeng ikaduda nyo kung ito ba ay lihitimong liham. Pero ang Windows noon ay itinatago ang salitang .vps na siyang naging dahilan kung bakit ang mga taong nakatanggap nito ay inakalang ito ay isa lamang liham na nakasave sa file extension na .txt file. Ngayon, ano nga ba ang ginagawa nito sa ating mga computer? Kung sakali man na isa ka sa hindi mapalad na nakatanggap ng love letter daw at buksan nito, ang Visual Basic Script ay maa-activate. Sa madaling sabi, ang VBS ay ang pinagsama-samang command codes na nag-uutos sa isang computer kung ano ang gagawin. Sa pagkakataong mabuksan nito at mag-run sa iyong computer, ang computer mo ay may malaking potensyal na masira at ang virus din na ito ay nagdidelete ng mga random files na nakasave sa iyong computer. Pero hindi lang yan ang ginagawa ng script na ito. Ang code ay naguutos sa computer na buksan ng iyong Windows address book o yung mga email na nakasave sa iyong computer at gagawing tulay ng I love you virus ito upang maipadala niya ang sarili sa lahat ng iyong email contacts. At ito nga ang dahilan kung bakit ito ngayon ay naikalat ng gusto sa milyong-milyong mga computer hindi lang sa Pilipinas kung hindi sa buong mundo. Ang lugar kung saan ito pinaka nagsimula ay sa lugar ng pandakan. Noong una, paisa-isa lamang ang pagpapasa-pasa ng virus sa computer sa mga bahay-bahay dahil syempre, noong mga panahon na ito, malamang kakaunti pa lang ang may sariling computer sa mga bahay-bahay dahil alam naman natin na ang computer dati ay mahal. Pagkatapos umatake ng virus sa mga household computers natin, napunta ngayon ito sa mga corporate email system ng malalaking kumpanya na siyang may maraming hawak na mga email sa iba't ibang bansa. Ito ngayon ang nag-trigger ng worldwide outbreak sa nasabing virus. Ang unang ibang bansa na inatake nito ay ang Hong Kong. Dumali ito ng milyong-milyong mga computer. Pagkatapos nito ay sa Europe. 
at mabilis na nakaabot sa United States. At ang nasabing computer virus outbreak ay nagresulta ng halos 10 bilyong dolyar in damages sa buong mundo at ang numerong iyan ay ang initial damage pa lamang. Iba pa ang pagpapatigil at pagbubura sa nasabing virus na nagkakahalaga ng humigit kumulang 15 billion dollars. At ito lahat ay sa loob lamang ng 10 araw mula nung nailabas ang virus. Base sa mga nakatala, ito ay nakaapekto sa halos 60 million na mga computers na sinasabing 10% ng kabuang computer na nakakonek sa internet noong araw. Ang pagtanggal nito ay hindi naging madali para sa United States. Para hindi ito makapasok sa main system ng Pentagon at CIA, nag-decide sila na pansamantalang isara ang lahat ng kanilang emailing system habang patuloy ang pag-aasik ng lagim ng nasabing virus. At nung mga pagkakataon na iyon nga, ang nasabing I love you virus na gawa ng isang Pinoy ang pinakamapaminsalang computer virus sa buong mundo. At hindi lang dyan nagtatapos ang legacy ng virus na ito. Well, maraming nagsasabi na ito daw ang naging inspirasyon sa kanta ng isa sa pinakasikat at laging nasa local top 10 billboard list noon, ang bandang Pet Shop Boys. Sila ay nakapagbenta ng milyong-milyong records sa buong mundo at may hawak din ng most successful duo in United Kingdom music history sa London base sa Guinness Book of Records. Ginawa nila ito ng kanta na may pamagat na Email. At ito nga daw ay base sa kumalat na computer virus na gawa ng infamous Onel de Guzman ng Pilipinas. Hindi ko lang maplay ang kanta dahil baka makapiray pero war not my friend, magbibigay ako ng counting lyrics para sa inyo. Hindi ako singer pero ayun, sabi nila sa kanilang kanta, send me an email that says I love you, send me an email that says I love you. Ah, uh, pagpasensya na ako pero nasira ko yung pangalan ng magandang kanta. Mag-iiwan na nga lang ako ng link sa description upang inyong mapakinggan at mabisita ang kanta. Heh, ano ba yan? At mabalik tayo ngayon. Ngayon nagkaroon na tayo ng kaalaman tungkol sa nasabing virus, kung paano ito kumalat, kung anong mga bansa ang naapektuhan at kung paano ito ginawa. Ano kaya ang nangyari kay Onel de Guzman at sa kanyang kaibigan? Well, noong mga pagkakataon na kumalat ang virus, ang kanilang ISP o Internet Service Provider ay ang Sky Internet at ang nasabing ISP ay dinumog ng iba't ibang mga tawag na galing sa mga European computer users. Sa tingin ko na damay sila sa isyo dahil syempre ang Sky Cable ang ginamit na ISP ni Onel upang ipakalat ang ginawa niyang virus. Gumawa sila ngayon ng parang task force na pinamumunuan ni Darwin Bawasanta. Ito ay upang mag-imbestiga at doon lumutang ang pangalan ng dalawang tao, ito nga si Rionel Romanes at si Onel de Guzman. Natuntun ngayon nila ang apartment na tinitirhan ni Rionel at ni Onel de Guzman. Pero ito ngayon ng twist sa kwento natin. Bagamat tukoy na ng mga otoridad kung sino-sino ang mga nasa likod nito, hindi nila alam kung ano ang ipapatong na kaso sa kanilang dalawa dahil wala pang batas noon ang tumutukoy sa krimen na ginawa ng magkaibigan. May isa na nagsuggest na ito daw ay pasok sa Republic Act 8484 o Access Device Regulation Act. Pero ang problema dito ay itong balas na ito ay ginawa para sa mga credit card fraud na obviously ang ginawa ni Onel ay hindi naman talaga tumutukoy sa pagkuha ng mga information about sa credit cards. Ang isa naman ay ang malicious mischief sa loob ng Philippine Revised Penal Code of 1932 involving damage to property. Bagamat totoo nga na may mga napinsalang mga ari-arian, hindi ito tumutukoy sa mga virus. Nagkaroon ng mabusising pag-iimbestiga ang mga otoridad dito at base sa salaysay ni Onel ay hindi niya daw alam ang consequences ng ginawa niya since hindi naman talaga niya gustong kumalat ng uso ang virus. Kumbaga hindi intention na gumawa ng kabataan. He is not really aware whether or not the acts imputed. At pagkatapos ng mabusising paglilitis sa kaso, ang kaso laban sa dalawa ay ibinasura ng korte at pinalaya din ang magkaibigan. Mabilis din naman gumawa ng aksyon ng gobyerno. Dalawang buwan lang makalipas mula noong pumutok ang I Love You Virus ay nagkaroon ng tinatawag na Republic Act 8792 o E-Commerce Law. Ito ngayong batas na ito ang gagamitin kung may mangyari mang katulad nito. Ang isa pang malaking tanong ngayon ay nasaan na si Onel de Guzman? Marami akong nabasa sa internet na siya daw ay hinayar ng CIA at NSA o National Security Agency na nakabase sa US. May mga nagsasabi rin na siya ay nasa Pentagon upang protektahan ang United States laban sa mga virus attacks. Alam niyo wala akong konkretong sagot kaya kung sino man ang nakakalam sa inyo please gusto ko ring malaman kung nasaan ang legendary duo na ito. 
At bago tayo magtapos na isip ko lang ano, ang mga hacker dito sa Pilipinas imbes na i-hire bilang whole buster o tagatingin kung may butas man ang kanilang website ay madalas ikinukulong pa. Samantalang ang ginawa lang naman nila sa website ng gobyerno ay sabihin na ito na ba ang security nyo? Napakadali namang i-hack tapos sa dulo ilalagay nila ang kanilang quote-unquote hacking world code name. Halimbawa, Boss Kila has hacked your website, etc. etc. parang ganun. Alam nyo sa mundo ng hacking mayroon tayong tinatawag na black, gray at white hat. At ang ibig sabihin ng white hat, ang mga hacker na ito ang hinahire talaga ng mga agency upang i-hack ang kanilang website at sa ganitong paraan, malalaman at mapoprotektahan nila ito ng husto. Samantalang ang mga black hat naman ay ang kabaliktaran. Ginagawa nila ito para sa kanilang sarili. Kumukuha sila ng pera gamit ang pangahack. Ang gray hat naman ay nasa gitna na pwedeng gamitin ang kanilang nalalaman sa mabuti o masama. At sana nakakuha kayo ng kaunting kalaman sa ating paksangan. So that's how uh, we need uh, what we call protocols in our application layer. So in our SMTP and POP, so those are the examples of what we call mga video reference natin. Okay. So FTP, let's proceed to the FTP. Uh, is another commonly used application layer protocol FTP was developed to allow for file transfer between a client and a server an FTP client is an application that runs on a computer that is used to push and pull files from server running the FTP mode or FTPD alright so please watch this one so to the, to explain further what is FTP Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about FTP, SFTP, and TFTP. And these are protocols that are used to transfer files over a network. So let's talk about FTP first. Now FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol and this is a standard protocol that is used to transfer files between computers and servers over a network such as the Internet. So in a nutshell, FTP is the language that computers use to transfer files over a TCP IP network. So for example, if someone anywhere in the world wanted to make their files available for other people to download, all they would have to do is simply upload their files to the FTP server and then other people from anywhere in the world can simply connect to that FTP server and download the files using the FTP protocol. Now in this example, this person is using a dedicated FTP server to share their files. But they don't necessarily have to set up a dedicated server for an FTP because if they really wanted to, they can also configure their own computer to act as an FTP server. For example, in Microsoft Windows, this can be done using the Internet Information Services Manager. Now, there are a couple of ways to transfer files using FTP. You can use your standard Internet browser, or you can use an FTP client. So as an example, let's download some MP3 files that someone has put on an FTP server. So let's use a standard internet browser in this example. So you would open up a web browser and then you would type in the address of the FTP server that you want to connect to just as if you were going to a regular website. So the web address of this FTP server is ftp.example.com. So you would type that address as the URL. Now normally if you were going to a regular website the prefix would be HTTP, but since we are going to an FTP site, the prefix is FTP. So now we're connected to the FTP server. So here is an example of an FTP server view in a web browser. And from here you can browse different folders that's on the FTP server, depending on what the owner has made available, and then you can view and download what you want. So here are the MP3 files, and then you can just click the files and then download them to your computer. 
Now sometimes FTP servers will require an account with a username and password and sometimes you can just log in anonymously. It just depends on what type of authentication that the owner of the FTP server has set up. And another way that you can connect to an FTP server is by using an FTP client. Now there are a number of FTP clients that you can use but probably the most popular free FTP client is called FileZilla which you can download for free. So here is an example of an FTP client. And as you can tell, using an FTP client provides a graphical user interface and a better overall experience than using a web browser. So up here is where you would provide the address of the FTP server along with the username and password if required and the port number which would be port 21. And then you would just hit the connect button and now we're connected to the FTP server. So over here on the left pane, you have the files and folders on your local computer. And then over here on the right pane, you have a view of the files and folders that's on the remote FTP server. And then from here, you can just click or drag and drop files from the FTP server, such as these MP3 files, and then download them to your computer just by clicking on them or dragging them over from the right pane to the left pane. And if you have the proper permissions, you can also upload files from your computer to the FTP server by dragging them from the left pane to the right pane, and then the files will be uploaded to the FTP server. So transferring files between computers is a common use of using FTP, especially when you're transferring files in bulk. And another common use of using FTP is to give the ability of website designers to upload files to their web servers. Now the main drawback of using FTP is that it's not a secure protocol. So the data that's being transferred is not encrypted. All the data is sent in clear text, which can cause security concerns. So really, FTP should only be used on a limited basis or on only trustworthy networks, or if the data that's being transferred is not sensitive. However, if you're going to transfer data that needs to be protected, a more secure transfer protocol should be used. And that's where SFTP comes in. SFTP stands for Secure File Transfer Protocol. Now, Secure FTP is just like FTP, except that it adds a layer of security. The data using secure FTP is actually encrypted using secure shell during data transfer. So no data is sent in clear text. It's all encrypted. And secure FTP authenticates both the user and the server, and it uses port 22. It's also important to note that both FTP and secure FTP are connection-oriented protocols that use TCP for file transfer, so they guarantee file delivery. And finally, there's TFTP. TFTP stands for Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Now this is a very simple file transfer protocol. It is not used to transfer files over the internet like FTP and Secure FTP does. It's mainly used for transferring files within a local area network. For example, it's often used to transfer configuration files and firmware images to network devices, such as firewalls and routers. So TFTP is something that most people will never use. And unlike FTP and Secure FTP that uses the TCP protocol for file transfer, TFTP is a connectionless protocol that uses UDP instead. And because it uses UDP instead of TCP, it's an unreliable transfer protocol. And if you're not familiar with TCP and UDP, I will link my video at the end of this lesson that explains the difference between the TCP and UDP protocols. And finally, TFTP does not provide any security during the transfer. And not that it needs to, because as I said before, it's only used on a local area network and not over the internet. All right, so now uh, I have here with me 
uh, install FileZilla. So if you are planning to interact with your files on the network, okay, you can use the FileZilla. Also, you can download this uh, application on the internet. So just search uh, file zilla okay. and download the client version this one download mo siya and then install okay so again uh, we have two way uh, two way para nga ma ma access mo ang iyong mga files or maka-perform ka sa file transfer protocol or FTP by using the uh, standard which is using the browser and then the other one is using the application which is your file the Zilla so let's proceed this one DGP the dynamic host configuration protocol service enables devices on a network to obtain IP addresses and other information from a DGP server this service automates the assignment of IP addresses, subnet mask, gateway, and other IP uh, networking parameters. DGP allows a host to obtain an IP address dynamically when it is when it connects to the network. The DGP server is contracted and an address is requested. The DGP server chooses an addresses from a configured range of addresses called a pool and assigns list. Uh, recess it to the host for a set period. Now, so again, let's watch, watch this one, the DGP. So for you to be able to be uh, well known of this. Okay, watch this one. This DHCP scope. Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about DHCP, or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Now, every computer or device on a network has to have an IP address for communication purposes. An IP address is an identifier for a computer or device on a network. And there are two ways that a computer can be assigned an IP address. It could be done by using a static IP, or a dynamic IP. Now, a static IP is where a user assigns a computer or device with an IP address manually. Now, this was the original method that was done in the beginning of networking. So, for each computer on a network, you had to open up the computer's network configuration page and manually type in an IP address. But in addition to an IP address, you also had to type in a subnet mask, default gateway, and a DNS server. And anytime that you wanted to add another computer or device to the network, you had to do the same thing. So as you might have guessed, this could be a lot of work, especially if you were dealing with a large network that has a lot of computers. And you also had to make sure that all the IP addresses are unique because if you assign the same IP address twice, it would cause an IP conflict and would cause those computers to not have access to the network. But there is a better and easier way to assign a computer an IP address, and this is called a dynamic IP. A dynamic IP is where a computer gets an IP address automatically from a DHCP server. A DHCP server automatically assigns a computer with an IP address. And in addition to an IP address, it can also assign a subnet mask, default gateway, and a DNS server. So as an example, here we have the Network Connection Properties window open for the network interface card on a Microsoft Windows computer. And as you can see here, this computer is set to obtain an IP address automatically. So when you choose this option, the computer would broadcast a request for an IP address on the network. Then the DHCP server will assign an IP address from its pool 
and deliver it to the computer. And then once that's done, you can verify all the different settings that the DHCP server has given your computer. And you can do this by opening up a command prompt on a Windows computer and then type in ipconfig space forward slash all and then press enter. So as you can see here, the DHCP is enabled on this computer, which means that it's getting its IP address from a DHCP server. And then you can see the IP address here, along with the subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS server. So all of these settings were given by the DHCP server. So as you can tell, dynamic IP addressing is the best choice because it's automatic and it makes managing a network a lot easier. Now, a DHCP server assigns IP addresses to computers on a network from its scope. And a scope is a range of IP addresses that a DHCP server can hand out. So as an example here, we see a scope of IP addresses on this server. So as you can see, the range starts with this IP address and ends with this IP address. So computers on this network will get an IP address from this range of IP addresses. So this scope can give out 100 IP addresses. Now these values can be customized to either increasing or decreasing the range. It all depends on what the network administrator wants to do. So it is customizable. Now when computers obtain an IP address from a DHCP server, the server assigns the IP address as a lease. So the computer doesn't actually own the IP address. It's actually a lease. And a lease is the amount of time an IP address is assigned to a computer. For example, the lease could be for one day. Now the reason for the lease is to help make sure that the DHCP server does not run out of IP addresses in its scope. So as a demonstration, let's just say that this DHCP scope only has a range of three IP addresses. So it can only give out three IP addresses. Now obviously this is not very realistic because no network administrator is going to create a scope this small. But for this demonstration, let's just use this as an example. So let's go ahead and add three computers to this network. And as they are added, the DHCP server is going to assign them an IP address. So in this example, let's just say that the IP addresses are actually given to the computers and are not leased. So the DHCP has reached its limit on giving out IP addresses. All of its IP addresses are currently being used. But what happens if one of these computers is removed from the network? So if a computer is removed, it takes the IP address that it has been given with it. So let's say another computer gets added to the network. But the problem is the computer won't be able to access the network because the DHCP server has run out of IP addresses. So even though this computer here has been removed, it's still occupying an IP address that could be used for another computer. So this is why IP addresses are leased and are not given. Because if the IP addresses are leased, then this will tell the DHCP server which IP addresses are still being used and which ones are not being used. So in this example, the IP addresses are leased. So after a certain period of time during the lease, the computers will send a signal to the DHCP server asking the server to renew its lease of the IP address. So in other words, it's informing the DHCP server that it's still present on the network and its IP address is still being used. So if a computer is removed from the network, that computer is not going to be able to ask the DHCP server for a renewal. And if it doesn't ask for a renewal, then the lease will expire 
and then the IP address will go back to the IP address pool. So now the IP address can be used for another computer. And this is why IP addresses are leased. Now if you wanted a computer or device on your network to have a specific IP address all the time, in other words, you never want that IP address to change, well you can create a reservation on the DHCP server. A reservation ensures that a specific computer or device identified by its MAC address will always be given the same IP address when that computer or device requests an IP address from the DHCP server. So for example, on this DHCP server, if I create a reservation for my computer, the DHCP server will recognize my MAC address and will always give me this specific IP address. Now, reservations are not typically given to regular computers. They are typically given to special devices or computers such as network printers, servers, routers, etc. Because devices like these should be given the same IP address constantly. Now one final thing to note about DHCP is that DHCP is a service that runs on a server. For example, this could be a Microsoft server or a Linux server. But it's also a service that runs on many routers also. Whether the router is a business router or a small office, home office router, these routers will have a DHCP service built into them. Alright, so that's how the dynamic host configuration protocol works on the network. Uh, so let us check our computer using the SMD. Okay, let's check the IP address. IP config. So as you notice, in my case, uh, I have an IP address 192.168.1.9. Alright, so ang muna siya ang nabaton ko sa akon nga network, sa akon nga local area network. So every time na mag-connect ako sa akon nga network, mag-disconnect ako. So this IP address could be... Uh, will be changed okay so once I shut down my computer and then uh, on the next day if I connect my computer again so it could be uh, the same or it could be uh, different IP address na so that's because of the dynamic host configuration protocol it depends upon on the range set that you set in your starting and ending pole of your dynamic host configuration protocol so now let's talk about telnet services and protocol long before desktop computers with sophisticated graphical interface existed people used text based system which were often just display terminals physical, uh, physically attached to a central computer once network were available people needed a way to remotely access the computer system in the same manner that they did with the directly attached terminals. Telnet was developed to meet the need. Telnet dates back to the early 1970s and is among the oldest of the application layer protocols and services in the TCP IP. So here we have an example. Uh, illustration here we have telnet then uh, computer and so forth so there is no graphical interface here then the IP address is running to one state that to the two telnet server so if you want to manage data in your computer okay you can communicate the users can communicate through terminals okay 
so the dis display that without display that without graphical interface so just like unlike this ma unlike this uh, system microsoft or windows there is uh what you call buttons everything is easy now because there is a uh, buttons uh, then the search bar and so forth so to easily manage uh, use our uh, platform so for us to be able to manage our uh, files or data in our uh, system so so let's proceed and services in the TCP IP uh, suit. Telnet provides a standard method of emulating text-based terminal uh, devices over the data network both the protocol itself and the client software that implements the protocol are commonly referred as uh, Telnet. So please watch this one. Uh, about Telnet. What is Telnet? So that is the topic of this video. Now Telnet is a terminal emulation program that is used to access remote servers. It's a simple command line tool that runs on your computer and it'll allow you to send commands remotely to a server and administer that server just as if you were sitting in front of it. So when you connect remotely to a server using Telnet, you would just use commands with a keyboard to tell that server what to do. So you can use those commands to run programs, create folders, delete files, create files, transfer files, browse directories, start or stop services, and so on. So pretty much you can do everything even if you're a thousand miles away from that server. And in addition to communicating with servers, Telnet is also used to manage and configure other network devices, such as routers and switches. And you can also use it to check if ports are open or closed on a server. Now, Telnet can be used with operating systems such as Windows and Mac OS, but it's largely used on Linux and Unix systems. So, as I stated before, Telnet is a command line tool. There is no graphical user interface. It's just a very simple text-oriented utility that'll run on a computer. In fact, you don't even have to have a computer to run Telnet. You can just use a simple dumb terminal. And all the commands are sent by using a keyboard. And because it only sends commands and not graphics, Telnet is very fast. Now, Telnet stands for Teletype Network, and it was developed back in 1969. And because it was developed prior to the Internet, security was not really an issue. So with Telnet, all the commands are sent in clear text, so there is no encryption. So if you were to use Telnet today to communicate with a server over the Internet, someone could easily eavesdrop and grab any sensitive data that you're sending to that server such as usernames and passwords. So because of the lack of encryption, Telnet is outdated, and it should not be used over the public internet. But some people still use it today, but largely in a local area network and not over the internet. But also they may have to use it if they are working with older equipment that can't support modern protocols such as SSH. Now, SSH, or Secure Shell, is a better alternative to Telnet. Secure Shell protects the data from being attacked or stolen as it's being transferred over a network. So, as I stated before, if you are sending sensitive data like a login or password, a hacker could be listening and steal the data. And that is the reason for Secure Shell. Secure Shell encrypts the data during the transfer and protects it from potential threats. And in addition to encryption, it also provides password and public key authentication. So Secure Shell does everything that Telnet does, but it's a secure protocol. And that's what people use today instead of Telnet. Now, if you want to see some interesting examples of Telnet, you can do this on your computer. And in my example, we're going to do this on a Windows machine. Now first, you have to enable the Telnet client in the Windows operating systems. So you first go into Programs and Features, 
and then you would click on Turn Windows Features On or Off, and from here you have to enable the Telnet Client feature. And then you would just open up a command prompt as an administrator, and then you can start some Telnet commands. So for example, if you want to see a Star Wars movie in a full ASCII version, at a command prompt, you just type telnet space towel dot blinkinglights dot nl, and then you press enter. And it'll show you an ASCII version of a Star Wars movie, which is really interesting. Or you can also play a game of chess using telnet. So you would just type telnet freechess dot org, and then the port number, which is 5000. And then you can play a telnet version of chess. Or if you want to know the weather forecast for a specific city, you can do that also. So you can just type telnetrainmaker.wonderground.com and then press enter. And then just enter a city code and it'll give you the weather for that city. So thank you everyone for watching this video on Telnet and SSH. Please subscribe, follow me on... Alright, so that's... Um... The net works in our network, so so again uh, to demonstrate with you, I have here with me the uh, SMD, uh, the what they call the. Uh, history of our uh, operating system the uses terminal okay so to communicate to communicate with their uh, data okay or to manage their data for example in our time if you want to go to the desktop uh, desktop folder I can check my files here okay by simply clicking the buttons okay so i can now check the directories or folders or files everything inside the desktop folder so as you can see here baba my desktop uh delay we can also check this one okay so by the use of this uh command so cd that that cd that that then cd or DIR, DIR meaning to check the directory of the C folder and then go to the CD users okay then DIR again uh, go to the CD and then admin okay DIR CD desktop then DIR now you can check you can see that uh, there is a files inside the desktop so let's look at the modules sample modules here so meaning DIR type is a file so in actual uh, with graphical user interface ang may itsura nyo ah. so I can interact with my files using this modern uh, uh, platform which is the operating system Windows 10 ok so way back in our in the history of what they call managing the files ok so we are using terminals to communicate with our files Okay, to manage our files so hindi siya git ka tama ka handy okay lalo na sa mga ano sa mga hindi siya uh, for all uh, users unlike yas aton nga no uh, modern windows os na subong so pwede na in all users may bata ka ni kabalo na magamit sa ano no sa computer desktop so let's proceed this one uh, in SMB or server message block so before go before we go to the uh, yes okay natapos na yung uh, telnet service and protocol 
this MB server uh, is MB server message block protocol uh, describes file system access and how clients can make requests for files it also describes the ECMB protocol inter-process communication all ECMB messages share a common format this format uses a fixed size header followed by a variable size parameter and data component ECMB messages can start authenticate and terminate sessions control file and printer access allow allow an application to send or, or receive messages to or from another device so let's check this one so file sharing using the ACMB protocol so we have ACMB responses, ACMB request we have uh, printers file system printers, mail slots, APIs and so on and so forth So let's take a look with this. Uh, In this video from IT Free Training, I will look at two file protocols supported by Windows. SMB. These two are SMB and NFS. To start with, I will look at SMB. SMB, or Server Message Block, was originally designed by IBM back in the 80s. Microsoft took the protocol and added additional features to it. This included other software used by Microsoft, like LAN Manager. This allowed the Windows operating system to map a drive to remote file share and have this network drive accessed on that computer just like a local hard disk. To make things simple, I will skip the third and fourth point, but I will get back to them in a moment. Microsoft released SMB 2.0 with Windows Vista. This was a major rewrite of the protocol, which besides adding additional features, it also reduced the chattiness of the protocol, in other words, how much data it transmitted over the network. SMB 3.0 was released with Windows 8 and Windows Server 2008 R2. It adds additional functionality and improvements to the protocol. A lot of these are aimed towards the data centers. When a network share is mapped, Windows still automatically performs the negotiation and works out which version of SMB needs to be used. So, what were those points that I skipped? In the late 90s, Microsoft attempted to rename SMB to SIFS, or Common Internet File System. This attempt was unsuccessful, so I skipped these points so as not to confuse you. SIFS had some additional features added to it. However, the name did not catch on, and future versions used the name SMB. For this reason, SIFS is referred to as a dialect of SMB. You may hear the terms SMB and SIFS used interchangeably, but they are essentially referring to Windows file sharing. As we move forward, however, only the term SMB should be used, and SIFS should be remembered as a thing of the past. The next file system that I will look at is Network File System, or NFS. This was originally developed by Sun and released in the late 80s. Version 1 was used internally in Sun and was never released. Version 2 was released to the public. This provided basic network file sharing and was used extensively with Unix-based systems. Version 3 was released in 1995 and added 64-bit support and supported files larger than 2 gigabytes. Version 4 was released in 2000 and added performance and security improvements. These improvements allowed for additional security methods to be applied to authenticate users, for example, Kerberos making version 4 of the protocol a lot more secure than previous versions. In the real world, which protocol would you use? Windows shares support SMB, NFS, or both. It is just a matter of configuring which one you need or both if you need both. In the real world, it is best to use a native protocol when possible. If you are connecting two Unix computers together, it is best to use NFS. If you are connecting two Windows computers together, it is best to use SMB. Even though both protocols achieve file sharing, 
there are differences in the way Windows and Unix-based systems handle file systems and users that use these systems. Mixing the two systems can lead to problems. NFS is good for host authentication. If you want to connect two servers together, you can do this quite easily. This can be placed in the boot up configuration and the data available to the operating system without having a user logged in. You could even connect to another server based on its IP address only. Windows requires user authentication in order to connect to an SMB share and generally the user needs to be logged in. It is possible to get around this, for example, for services running on the local system, but it is not as simple as NFS makes it. Windows is good for user authentication. Until version 4 of NSF, this was something that NFS did not handle that well and was prone to security problems. If you have a domain, then Windows handles user authentication quite well. Ultimately, the choice comes down to which operating system you are using and your software requirements. In later videos, I will look at how Windows file sharing works and also how to use NFS file sharing using Windows Server. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. Alright, so that's how the ACMB for Server Research Block Protocol uh, works. Alright, so let's proceed. P2P service and uh, what do, how do I uh, pronounce this one? Nutella, Nutella protocol. So many P2P applications do not use a central database to record all the files available on the peers. Instead, the device on the network each uh, tell the other what files are available when uh, queried and use the Nutella protocol and service services to support locating resources. See the figure when a uh, user is connected to the Nutella service. The client application will search for other Nutella nodes to connect to. These nodes handle queries for resources location and replies to those requests. They also uh, govern control messages which help the service discover other nodes. The actual file transfer usually rely on the ECTP services. The Nutella protocol defines five different packet types, uh, ping, uh, meaning for device discovery, pong, as a uh, reply to a ping, at yes, then the query for file location, then the query hit as a reply to a query push, query, then push as a download query. So we have here the illustration about P2P file, uh, P2P service, then Nutella uh, protocols. have five nodes or six nodes here so where is my song.mp3 Nutella allows P2P application to search for shared resources on peers All right. so I've got it then I've got it and so, and so forth So please watch this one.
right so next in our topic yes the skill building activities all right so instruction compare and contrast client server with peer to peer data transfer over network number two give the specific purposes of the dns http smb and smtp application layer protocols then for the number three compare and contrast dns and uh, http exchange between devices to enable data transfer to occur and number four compare and contrast smb and smtp exchange between devices to enable data transfer to occur then provide what are the general functions that applications layer protocol specify all right so for the what i know chart Right, so wait a minute. For the skill building, is listen. One client server data transfer specifically refers to the centralized source end of data communication as the server and the receiving end as the client. With peer-to-peer -peer data transfer, both client and server services are used within the same conversation. Either end of the communication can initiate the exchange or both devices are considered equal in the communication process. The devices on either end of the communication are called peers. In contrast to a client-server model, where a server is typically a centralized repository and responds to requests from many clients, peer-to-peer -peer networking has distributed data. Further, once the communication is established, the peers communicated directly, the data is not processed at the application layer by a third device on the network. 2. All these protocols use a client-server process. Domain name system provides users with an automated service that matches or resolves resource names and email domains with the required numeric device network address. This service is available to any user connected to the internet and running an application layer application such as a web browser or email client program. Hypertext Transfer Protocol was originally developed to publish and retrieve hypertext markup language pages and is now used for distributed, collaborative. Hypermedia Information Systems HTTP is used by the World Wide Web to transfer data from web servers to web clients. Server message block describes the structure of sharing network resources, such as directories, files, printers, and serial ports between computers. Simple mail transport protocol transfers outbound emails from the email client to the email server and transports email between email servers and so enables mail to be exchanged over. The Internet, POP, or POP3, delivers email from the email server to the client. 3. DNS includes standard queries, responses, and data formats. DNS protocol communications are carried in a single format called a message. This message format is used for all types of client queries and server responses, error messages and for the transfer of resource record information between servers. HTTP is a request-response protocol, a client application layer application, typically a web browser, sends a request message to the server. The server responds with the appropriate message. 4. SMB messages use a common format too.
start, authenticate, and terminate sessions. Control file and printer access. Allow an application to send or receive messages to or from another device. SMTP specifies commands and replies that relate to session initiation, mail transaction, forwarding mail, verifying mailbox names, expanding mailing lists, and the opening and closing exchanges. 5. Functions specified by application layer protocols include the processes that are to occur at either end of the communication. This includes what has to happen to the data and how the protocol data unit is to be structured. The application layer PDU used in this course is called data. The types of messages, these can include requests, acknowledgements, data messages, status messages and error messages. The syntax of the message, this gives the expected order of information in a message. The meaning of the fields within specific message types has to constant so the services can correctly act in accordance with the information. The message dialogues, this determines which messages elicit which responses so the correct services are invoked so the data transfer occurs. Alright, so for the activity number four, what I know, chart, what have you learned in this lesson? So please answer. Then for our activity number five uh, write the letters of the correct answers on the space provided when a user is connected to the service this service the client application will search for other nodes to connect to so number one uh, a Nutella B SMTP C HTTP D DHCP so what is the answer hmm so, it, uh, it is a letter, a Nutella. Number two, it is, is an application that runs on a computer that is used to push and pull files from server running the, the FTP demo. So, the keyword is push and pull files from server from running on the FTP demon peer-to-peer -peer client so D two, number 3 two or more computers are connected via network and can share resources without having a dedicated server hmm? without having a dedicated server connected via network and can share resources without having a dedicated as well about oh, having a dedicated server oh, without having a dedicated server all right so please research uh, the the Oh, no, the answers on our activity. So let's see oh, how far have we learned in this uh, module. So that's the end of our uh, module number eight. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice day.